I think it's been a really good day so far. Lots of really interesting topics. Um, I'm a little bit nervous because after listening to the Schwa presentation, uh, I want to make sure I haven't got any of those five words in here. I'm sure you'll be watching. And, and there was another really good one as well around vulnerability. And I think uh, changing a brand uh, and changing what you stand for or how people perceive you uh, leaves you really quite vulnerable uh, as a brand. And it's a big exercise that we went through uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, and I just want to kind of walk you through some of the behind the scenes, some of the ideas, some of the things we did, um, how we did them, and uh, hopefully it gives you a few ideas, insights. It's going to be a little bit interactive, so don't get too comfortable, uh, and questions are, are welcomed. So you'll notice purposely there's no branding on this slide. Um, so I don't want to kind of start to lead you down a path. Uh, I'll introduce it as we go along. So this is where you need to play your part now. Okay, so stand up if you've ever heard of TomTom. Tom. Well, that's a pretty good start. That's not too bad. Okay. Stay standing if you've ever used the TomTom Tom device or application. Okay, still doing okay. Stay standing if you've got an iPhone or you've ridden in an Uber. Okay, stay standing if you knew that TomTom Tom was the map that powered both of these. <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, thank you. And I think that's the biggest challenge we've got right now is we have a brand perception problem. But we've been around a long time. 30 years ago, uh, the business was founded, uh, and just before the turn of the century, uh, we launched the first navigation software. For those of us in the room who are, who are old enough to remember, and I don't think there's many, uh, before the iPhone used to have something called a Palm Pilot. There's a few nodding heads. Okay, software launched its first, uh, TomTom launched its first software on the Palm Pilot, okay? And that's what you use to navigate with. Uh, and in 2004, we brought the first portable device to the market and it was a game changer because at that point to get navigation in your car cost you about 5,000 euros and here you were with a device on the market that was pretty much sub 500 euros and it really changed the it changed the industry and there's a lot of things through there in 2006 we launched the first HD traffic uh, and that's really a big product that we're well known for now it's providing traffic services uh, to drivers in 2015, we launched the first high-definition maps for self-driving cars. Okay, so we've been working with companies building out self-driving technology for the past seven, eight years. Um, in 2020, we launched Digital Cockpit, which is an open source platform for car makers to build their connected devices and their connected navigation experience and driver experience upon. And last year, we launched something called TomTom Maps Platform. So there's lots of innovation happening uh, over the last 30 years. However, when we polled to do this brand research, and when we polled all of the different sectors that we work within, only 44% of the tech sector were even aware that TomTom was a brand, even when prompted to do so. I'm not going to tell you what it was before there was any prompts, but it was uh, considerably lower. Um, only 5% of those in tech just think about TomTom Tom in any part of the conversation around development and around technology. Awareness-wise, UK was the highest, and it's one of our core markets. Netherlands, which is our home market, was second, followed by France, and the lowest was Japan at 5%. USA was somewhere in the middle, uh, mid-teens. So, even though we've got 30 years of innovation, we brought lots of things to market, we're still primarily known for one thing. And we're known by a certain generation. And whenever I talk to somebody and you mention the word TomTom, Tom, it elicits one of three responses. One is, it's the thing my dad had used to have in his car that I stuck to the windscreen. Number two is who? And number three is, wow, are you guys still around? Okay, so we've got a really big job to do. And we had to do that by looking at the brand and what it represented. Now, this was a challenge. We are founder-led, okay? So there's a lot of equity and there's a lot of personalization in the brand. It was developed by them more than 30 years ago. It's had the same look and feel uh, since day one, and we wanted to change that. 
So the conversation started probably two years prior to start to seed that discussion. Well, how do you feel about changing the brand? We move from where we were and we need to move to where we're going as a brand. And it's hard. This is where we started. This is what we're known for, the hands. Okay. Uh, and it's been like that always. Uh, but it's not longer really our market. We've shifted from a B2C company, primarily in hardware, and we're now a B2B company, primarily in software and services. So we had to make lots of decisions, and it was a really, really long process, and it accelerated in the final year, but it started pre-pandemic. Um, so we did audience testing, and we chose developers and tech developers as our primary audience because those are the ones who are using our services, our software, our applications, etc. And we wanted to really understand, as you saw earlier, what they thought about the brand. We also wanted to test with our current customers and our employees to make sure they also understood what the brand stood for and where it was going. We also had to decide how we wanted to present the brand. It had to engage, it had to attract people, it had to stand for certain things. Um, and it wasn't just the logo, it's, it's the language as well. And way beyond all of this is all about the mission, the purpose, what we stand for. Uh, and I'm not going to go all the way into that today. Um, but the logo and how it's written is, is the primary thing that people see. What we found when we looked across all of the different markets that we tested, uh, these were some of the words that came out. So friendly, accessible, easy, reliable, trusted, smart. These were words that kept being repeated. I hope that none of these are bad words, by the way. <laughs> so we started with the word mark and how we write uh, the brand. And again, a little bit of a, a poll in a second. So there was many, many iterations and the list was huge. But this was the kind of the final four uh, that it came down to. So show of hands, who, who thinks number one works? A couple of people. Okay, number two. Number three, and number four. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, in the first poll, that's what it looked like. Okay, so actually the, 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 the one that was classed as more techie, uh, that was the, the, the favourite one when we, did, when we ran the first poll. And this is across, this is across developers in tech, uh, across employees and across uh, existing customers. Um, but each of these goes through another stage. We kind of try and pare it down a little bit. Um, what did these stand for? When we, again, when we asked the questions, um, number one, techie and cool. Number two, friendly, approachable. Number three, bold and fun. Number four, playful and fun. But also there's other comments. So number four, whilst it's playful and fun, was the hardest one to read. People really struggled a little bit to, to see it. Um, number three was the easiest to read. Uh, and the other two were reasonably uh, easy to read. And you can see there's lots of other comments in there as well that describe it. So we ran the second poll uh, to look at how the numbers look now. And again, Techie One comes out on top. We drop the lowest performing one and we go through the process again. And we do it a third time as well. And this time you start to see where it starts to change now when you start to pull out different, or you start to remove options. You start to see how it changes. Um, so eventually, uh, we got down to the one that was probably the favoured one. Uh, it's probably the one that we favoured as a team as well, but obviously we don't want to lead uh, what people see, uh, and that's where, we've, uh, that's where we've ended up. This is some of the, again, this is some of the comments that come back. Um, so the first one was seen as being trustful, approachable, legible, bold, unique. Um, second one was a little bit retro, uh, a little bit techy. Um, but again, didn't really kind of jump out that much when you compare it to all the others. Uh, the last one, uh, and, and the first one and the last one are not dissimilar in style, um, but again, not maybe uh, grabbing people quite as much. So we've got the word mark, okay? Half the job done. Now we've got to get the brand. And we looked at how it could be integrated uh, into the, the word mark that was chosen. And what we came up with was this. Um, and the idea of this was it was a very simple icon, um, but, it, sorry, but it portrayed something. And it, it gave people the idea of location, 
So you've all seen how pins get dropped on maps from different applications and services. Uh, it gave somebody that, that idea that we were talking about location information uh, and location data. Um, and being able to animate it in different ways gave us lots of, lots of options that we could do different things with it. So we started to test it on many, many things uh, and many, many areas from how it would look on a, on a billboard, uh, on the high street, etc., to how it would look in different scenarios from vehicles to buildings to apps to maps, to applications, et cetera, et cetera. And we tested it extensively over different ways. And we tried to put it in, in different forms as well. So what happens when we put it in this form, for example, where it's, uh, it's stacked here? How does it look? How does it look when you add just the word mark or the word mark um, and the logo on different things? And we really went through an exhaustive process. Um, and finally, at the end of the journey, this is what we got to. So this is now the brand that we rolled out in November last year. Um, it took close to three years to get to that point. Uh, majority of the work was done in the final year. And really the purpose of, of this presentation is to kind of show you just some of behind the scenes, but kind of talk more about the lessons learned uh, and the things we kind of did and found out along the way. And this is where I kind of encourage questions because Again, I think it's, I don't just want to talk to you about what we did and what we learned, but I think I'm keen to hear people's ideas as well. So, first one, heavy, heavy research. Uh, and I think we, we talked to thousands of people in many, many different markets, uh, from analysts to customers, to developers, to employees, to people who'd never even heard of us before, to really kind of understand what they looked for in a brand, what they trusted, what stood out from a brand. And we looked at brands in so many different markets that weren't our own, um, be that banking, be that sport, be that food and beverage. Uh, and we looked at what that brand and what that brand delivered and how the two came together. So what did the word mark? What did the logo? say about the brand when you compared it to what actually they did, whether they were a food brand, a banking brand, uh, whatever, it, whatever it was. As part of that, take the time to ask the right questions. And that's really, really hard to try and put the questions together because you don't want to lead and get the answers that you're looking for. You want it to be as open as possible because otherwise it just, I guess it skews your belief that you're doing the right thing. You want people to challenge you and say, actually, that isn't the right way to do it. Do it, some, do it a different way. And that can be anything from color to design to language, uh, etc. And number three, as I say, clearly define the questions because understand what it is you want to get as not the answer, but what's the outcome you're looking for. Because if you don't design the questions properly, you won't get the right answers and the right answers won't give you the solutions that you're looking for to make the decisions. Consider your audience. Uh, I think a lot of people, when we started this journey, didn't really know where we should look and where we should ask the questions. Uh, I think the internal group was equally as important as the external group because they've really got to be the, the brand ambassador, right? All your employees, whether it's a two, five, a few hundred, a few thousand. They're the ones that have got to be able to say, hey, I'm proud to work for this company. I I'm proud to show this brand. I want to wear it on my backpack, on my hoodie, on my pen, whatever it is. Um, so getting the buy-in from the employees was one of the biggest groups that we really kind of focused on. <laughs> this, this one was a big one. Don't underestimate where it's seen and what it touches and you cannot believe the size of a spreadsheet that you create in every asset that you have that needs to be rebranded. Everything from the, the envelopes in a stationary cupboard to your building outside, to the swag that you produce, um, etc. It's amazing where your brand is seen. Um, don't try and do it all at once. <coughs> You know, we, we, we have a rollout plan. It's ongoing and it will probably last more than a year. Our headquarter building in Amsterdam still portrays the old logo because it's going through a refit at the moment and there's no point 
in spending lots of money on putting a new logo on an old building. So we're happy to wait and have that, have that done at the right time. But the website, you know, things like that that people see every day, uh, that is your main kind of shop window. You know, that was one of the very, very first things to change. You know, the applications, so that what the things that people touch and interact with all the time. And as you start to move through, you know, with the things you use for events and everything, it all starts to roll. But one of the biggest things we found was if we tried to do it all at once, we would have failed miserably. Uh, so it has to have a rollout plan and it has to have rationale behind that rollout plan. And the last one, um, don't try and please everyone. Okay. Not everybody loves this. Okay. Even internally, there's people who still prefer the kind of the history and the nostalgia of where the brand was. Uh, over time, they're coming on board and they're changing. And even to the outside world, you know, we had a lot of comments, some quite polarizing uh, at the beginning, but the more people start to see it, the more people start to understand it, and the more people bring it together with the story and the narrative, uh, I think the more positivity we get uh, and the more, the more comments we get.